when was the last time that you were inconvenienced by someone? Or better yet, when was the last time you were an inconvenience to someone? I mean, we've all been an inconvenience, and we've all been inconvenienced. For, for example, maybe you were inconvenienced because you were in, in a hurry, you were trying to get somewhere, and you got a flat tire on the side of the road. And it just put everything that you were doing to a halt, and you're like, this is not what's supposed to happen. I've got to be somewhere. I've got things to do, people to meet. I'm an important person. Or maybe it was that extra project at work your boss gave you. The one that you didn't plan for. You, you were trying to get out early because you had plans for the weekend. You were trying to get away with the family, but the boss came to you and said, look, I've got this project. It's, it's, it's a rush order. I need you to get it done. I need you to get it done now. I, I don't care what it takes. Or better yet, maybe your kids came to you and said, mom, dad, I, I've got a project. It's due tomorrow. I need your help. But what they didn't tell you is that they've had the project for two weeks. And then you spend all night trying to get the project done. I mean, to be honest, we've all been inconvenienced. We've inconvenienced people with things that we expect them or want them to do because we need it now. It's urgent to us, so it should be urgent to them. A couple of weeks ago, we began this brand new series called Me to We, which is really this idea about you and I doing life and being in community with each other. What we said is this, is that me to we is all about when we move towards community, we move towards life. I think that every one of us here in this room can agree that we weren't designed to do life alone. That we were meant to do life with other people that are just like us. That are broken, that are flawed, that are messed up, that don't have their life all together even though we try to portray that we do. But we were designed for community. We were designed to do life with other people. We weren't designed to be alone. So if you have your Bibles this morning, I want to encourage you to turn to Acts chapter 2. And we're going to be in verses 42 through 47 where we've been all throughout this series. And my hope this morning is, is that no matter how many times you've read this passage, that you will look at it today with a fresh heart, with fresh eyes. That you won't just assume that I can check the box, that I've got this down, I do this well, I know how to make this happen. But that you would begin to look at it with eyes that open you up to be vulnerable. I mean, as we sang in that song just a few minutes ago, here am I. Lord, here am I, and that's my prayer this morning, that as we dive into this and we look at the church, as we look at you and I, as we look at us this morning, we begin to understand what it means for us to be in community, that it is better if we move from me to we, that we are stronger together than we are alone. So again, Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. You can also follow along in the church app if you have that as well. So starting in verse 42, it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. As I was reading through that, there were certain words that began to pop off the page to me. Something like, uh, they were committed to the apostles' teaching. They were committed to the gospel. They were committed to the word. That this was their foundation. That this is where they were going to get life from. They were committed to it. It wasn't just some, some book that set off to the side and, hey, we'll get to that when we have time. But what we discover is they were committed to it. They were committed to fellowship. They were committed to eating together and doing life together. They were committed to praying together. Not just simply alone, but together praying and beginning to put whatever is on their hearts out before those that they're doing life with. They were committed to be together. It said that they had everything in common. Everything. And I know you would look at your life and look at mine and say, well, I don't have the same interests that you have, so uh, us having everything in common. When they say they have everything in common, 
They were referring to the fact that they had everything in common when it came to Jesus. That they had one purpose and one purpose alone. That is the church, that they were going to be so committed to Jesus that they would do whatever he asked. And he really had only two simple things that he was asking. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. And love others the way that you long and desire to be loved. And because of that, it said that they were willing to sell all of the possessions and give to anyone who had need. No matter what the need was, they were willing to give to it. They were committed to meet with one another, no matter how busy their schedules got. No matter how preoccupied they could become, they were committed to meet with one another. They were committed. Again, they broke bread. He repeated that over and over. There's something, and I believe it so truly, that there is something about when you and I sit around together and we eat together, something happens that's different than you and I sitting in rows here today. I mean, as good as this is and as, and as awesome as it is that you and I can gather together as the church, as a community, and worship and pour out our hearts because of what God is doing in our lives, it's great. But it goes to a whole nother level when we're willing to gather together and break bread and eat with one another, something happens that doesn't happen here in Rose. We begin to become an open story, an open book of our lives. The things that are happening within us that we don't usually share, but something within that moment, it tears down the walls and it allows us to become completely and totally vulnerable, to open ourselves up to something that can only happen and community. See, Christian hospitality is what I want to talk about, this idea of being inconvenienced when it comes to hospitality. This is what the church was known for, and it should be what you and I are known for. Listen to what it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 13. It says, share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Share. Share everything that you have, everything that is about you, share it, be open, and practice hospitality. See, in this context here, as Paul was writing in Romans chapter 12, it means that hospitality is always on. I don't know what that looks like for you, but I can tell you just a little bit what that looks like for me and for my family and my wife. I'm the always on guy. Hey, yeah, let's do this. Let's have it. Let's open our house. Let's have whoever wants to come over. My wife's like, really? And nothing against my wife. I'm not bashing my wife, so don't think that whatsoever because she has an amazing heart, so I don't want you to misunderstand me. She'll beat me later, so it's okay. <laughs> but we're just two different personalities. And I get this idea of always being on, having this posture of always being willing to live my life with an open hands to say, okay, God, here am I, whatever you want, wherever you want to take me, whatever you want to do, I don't, I don't care what interruptions it causes. I'll open myself up to you. I'll live a life with a posture of open hands. And this, within the early church, it goes beyond the modern concept that we have for socializing. Because hospitality was an opening of worshipers' lives. It was people willing to open up their, their life and their hearts to those who had needs. Hospitality is friendship to the stranger. Just simply meeting people where they are with no expectations. Not trying to look deeper than the surface and trying to discover what is all about their life, but just meeting them where they are, no matter where they've been, no matter what they've done, no matter what's been done to them. It's kindness to the brokenness. It's kindness to those that have been hurt, that have wounds that run deeper than you and I could ever understand. Because let's be honest, not every one of us in here has the same picture when it comes to our lives. Your life and your experiences haven't been identical to mine. And yet for some, we would come and, and assume that we have this mindset that we understand exactly where everybody comes from when we don't. And that's okay. That's okay. But just being willing to be open and to allow God to begin to use you the way that he longs and desires to use you as we discover with the very first church. And these were followers that after Jesus had died on the cross, 
and was placed in the tomb and then three days later rose for the, from that tomb and then spent 40 days walking around showing himself to his disciples and other people. That they as the church gathered together and Luke writes about it here in Acts. And he begins to give us a glimpse of what it looks like when we begin to live out the hands and the feet of Jesus and begin to be the church. So if you'll turn over a page probably in your Bible to Acts chapter 4, I want you to see even more in depth what he's talking about when it comes to this idea of hospitality and really coming from the idea of being inconvenienced. It said all the believers were one in heart and mind. I mean, something that he said in Acts chapter 2. No one claimed that any of their possessions were their own, but they shared everything that they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses, they sold them. And they brought the money from the sales and they put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. Now, when we read that, that is completely countercultural to the way that we live and the way that we look at life or the way that we were taught about life and the way that we were taught about doing life with other people. I mean, whether we say it or not, whoever has the most toys at the end wins, right? I mean, we don't have to say it. I don't have to say it. Just take a peek into my life. And you begin to see what's most important to me, what I value the most. I mean, and the same thing is true for you, and the same thing was true for them. They all had one heart, one mind. They were connected with one purpose, one agenda. Not many, but one. And they didn't claim that anything that they had was theirs, but they said everything that they have, it is for the community, it's for the church, it's for those who have need. So if I have something that you need, it's yours. Take it. That's what they were saying. They were living their life with open hands. And they said, we're going to stay committed to the gospel. We're going to stay committed to the teaching of the apostles. We're going to continue to testify about the resurrection of Jesus. We're going to tell people about how Jesus has changed our life and how he can change theirs. And if we have something that we can sell for the benefit of someone else, let's sell it. Again, this idea of hospitality, and especially inconvenient hospitality. Because for them, hospitality was an opening of worshipers, as I said. It was them opening their lives and their hearts to anyone who had need. Again, it was the friendship to strangers. It is the kindness to brokenness. True hospitality, it's inconvenient, not just practic on a practical level, but also on an emotional level. It's inconvenient. I mean, let's be honest. It's inconvenient. When somebody calls you and says, hey, can I come over? What's the first thing that runs through your mind? Is the house clean? I mean, let's just be honest. Let's put all of our cards on the table. My wife and I have done a small group for years and off and on we've done it in our home and also at the church. And there's just something different about when you do it in your home. And especially the level of stress at times that it brings. Did you clean the bathroom? Uh, did you vacuum? Did you dust? Did you make sure you picked up after the dog? Uh, did, did, the, did the kids clean their room? Uh, is the mess? I, I mean, come on, we, we, we try to polish up our lives and we put this thing on display, but in reality, the way your house normally looks is probably how your life looks, at least it is for me. And at times, it's just messy, but we're afraid to display that mess because if we display that mess, people will look at us and think differently of us. At least that's what we think. Hospitality is inconvenient, practically and emotionally. I'm not sure true community begins until we're willing to inconvenience ourselves for each other. I'm not sure it begins until we're willing to be inconvenienced. And there's a challenge with engaging people. It's people. That, that's the challenge. 
People are the challenge. The emotional inconvenience we embrace in community is parceled with the understanding that the very people to whom we are opening our lives to, they'll hurt us. They'll let us down. They'll challenge us. I mean, that's the beauty of community. And I know what we do is we put our guard up. We protect ourselves and and we put a shield around us to say, I don't want to be hurt. I I don't want to be let down. I, I, I don't want to be challenged. Can I let you in a little secret? Every one of us has has had meaningful relationships that have hurt us. It's inevitable. Why? Because we're people. (laughs) We're people. We're we're people with flaws. We're, We're people that are filled with mistakes. We're people that are just totally and completely and utterly selfish. Again, for many years, Tracy and I have tried to live out this idea of hospitality. A couple of things that we've done over the years is we've opened up our home every Thanksgiving for people that didn't have a place to go for Thanksgiving. We did it for a number of years. And we would set up tables all throughout our house, at our backyard, our patio, for anyone that didn't have a place to go for Thanksgiving. And the reason why was because when we moved here, we didn't have family. And we remember our first Thanksgiving thinking to ourselves, who are we going to celebrate with? Are we going to travel back home and try to uh, get back there and try to get back here as fast as we can because we only have a couple of days and that's a really quick turnaround and we were a young married couple that, uh, you know, every penny uh, counted at that time. And it wasn't like we just had this unlimited funds that we could just pull from and say, oh, we can just go get a plane ticket. We can just go there and back. No big deal. And then it really, uh, you know, changed the dynamics when kids came into the picture. Oh, we got to travel with kids and traveling with kids. And and to be honest, my wife and I, we've lived here for 24 years. And we've been married 25. And in those 24 years, we've gone back home one time for Thanksgiving. We just made the decision early on that we wanted to experience Thanksgiving with people that were just like us. They really didn't have a place to go, so we just opened up our home. (laughs) And I can remember when one of our family members came out and they came to Thanksgiving at our house, they were like, why are you doing this? It's such a hassle, it's such a headache. What does this cost you? I mean, all the time and the preparation, you gotta understand, my wife's a school teacher. And early on, they were getting out of school on Wednesday, on a half day. And we were doing Thanksgiving on Thursday, and we would have anywhere from 20 to 40 people show up to our house. It was inconvenient. I mean, for all of us, for me, for my wife, for my kids, and I got to be honest, I don't cook. (laughs) So that really piled it on for Tracy. But we didn't look at it as an inconvenience. We looked at it as an opportunity. Because we knew what it was like to be alone. And we didn't think other people should feel that way. And we wanted to do life with them. I mean, we've opened up our home for community groups and different Bible studies and different activities because we made the decision a long time ago. It's not our house. Whatever God wants to do with it, it's yours. I mean, I I love it now as a dad when my kids bring over their friends. I mean, my pocketbook, on the other hand, at times, having boys... But I love it. I love it when they're running around and being crazy and and sometimes it's a little overwhelming. But man, those kids know that they can just come to my house and it's safe. And they got a place where people love them and they'll provide food for them anytime they want it. To live your life open the way that the church does. And I don't want you to misunderstand me. And think, oh, Corey's got this figured out, it's perfect. No, it's not. There's been times where we've closed ourselves off and said, you know what? Let somebody else do it. When we knew that we should have been open about it, but we didn't. Journeying together through life, both in my personal life and also as my role as a pastor, I've come to see that inconveniences and challenges of being in real community 
what they've done for me, they've helped me in my growth towards God. They've helped me in my growth towards God. Being inconvenienced has helped me to grow as a believer, as a follower of Jesus. I mean, those regular everyday challenges of friendship, those regular everyday challenges of community, and I'm not talking about uh, relationships that are based on abuse or mistreatment, because I believe those are constituted as a toxic environment and we should avoid those. And I empathize deeply with anyone who's experienced that. But authentic community, it has a shadow. It has a shadow. Human beings, we are complex. We all carry brokenness. We have personality uh, quirks and the ability to make choices that hurt other people. And no matter how painful it can be, community this unwanted byproduct of it is the key part of the purpose of you and I becoming the people that God wants us to be, to begin to practice this interpersonal gospel actions, actions like forgiveness, actions like graciousness and kindness, actions like patience. And what we begin to learn is we begin to practice the ways of Jesus as a local community, as a church, is we begin to train and develop ourselves for everyday life. It has to start with you and I as a community, getting into community with one another. See, community wasn't designed to be sterile or clinical or polished. It was designed to be real. Community is designed to be real. I mean, go back to Acts chapter 2 and to Acts chapter 4. They were real with one another. If someone was hurting, they loved them. Even if they didn't necessarily agree, they loved them. They began to open up for them and allow them to share their hurt and their pain. When someone had need, they gave. They gave of themselves. See, without any inconvenience or brokenness, We only have a caricature of actual biblical community. If we're not willing to be inconvenienced, if we're not willing to experience brokenness, all we have is a picture of what biblical community should look like. I mean, that's what we have is a picture here in Acts 2 and Acts 4. It's a picture that Paul or Luke gave us to display for us what community looks like. Until you and I begin to take root of that, then it's just a picture. It's not reality. See, the challenges of being in community are one of God's tools to bring us to maturity. It grows us. It develops us. So let me ask you this question. When's the last time that you volunteered? When's the last time that you volunteer? Because, see, I believe there are two important practical expressions of inconvenience hospitality. The first one is volunteering. Volunteering through the local church. And if you're part of Mountain Ridge, that means volunteering here at Mountain Ridge. Because volunteering, it changes a person. It changes their relationship with the community of people they're doing life with. And a study shows that 95% of the people who volunteer say that it enriches their life and gives them purpose for their life. So instead of asking this question, what did I get from church today? Volunteering begins to shift the question to this. How did I contribute to someone else's life today? How did I contribute to someone else's life? It's the difference between consumerism and contribution. And we live in a consumer-driven culture that says it's all about me and it's always about me and me is always on. But when we flip the switch and we begin to live the way that Jesus intended us to live, it moves from consumerism to contribution. And it's for this reason that I have actually encouraged my own kids to volunteer in our church. From a very early age, I've encouraged my kids to volunteer in the church. When we drive home from church, I will ask them this question. Whose life did you make a difference in today? 
Because I believe it's a better narrative than this. What did you get out of the preaching today? And I know a lot of times when we come, what we do is we sit and we look for that, that epiphany, that great moment, that life-changing, oh, that's it. But what if for just a moment we moved it from what I got to what I can give? One is focused on giving it away and the other one is focused on getting. There's a paradox. There's a paradox that we have that the more we give away of our own humanity, the more we'll grow. And I believe the deeper you and I will begin to experience community. So the first is, when's the last time that you served? The second expression of inconvenient hospitality is what people do outside of the weekend services. What you and I do outside of this time, because all of us, we have an hour, maybe two hours that we're involved in church on a weekly basis, and there's still 98.9% .9 of our week that's remaining. So what do we do during that remaining time? How do we begin to practice hospitality? How do we begin to open our homes and our lives? How do we begin to embrace the reality of the imperfections of community? And we begin to embrace it as something that's important. Because our instinct, if we're left to ourselves, if we're given the option on our own, we're going to avoid it. And we're going to avoid it like the plague. So why? Why? Why should we put ourselves in a position to serve, to give of ourselves, to help someone else, to come to know and to meet and to follow Jesus? I mean, our mission here is simple at Mountain Ridge. It's about bringing people back to God. But if we never open ourselves, if we never give of ourselves, how will we ever bring anyone back to God? And God wants to use you. He wants to use me. So opening up yourself. See, we must lean into the imperfections of community. It's God's plan. It's his plan to mature us, to grow us, to give us opportunities to look more and more like Jesus, no matter how broken, no matter how fallen, no matter how much it hurts, no matter how selfish people are. See, keeping our distance, it may be less risky, but I believe it robs us of true community. Because community... It acts as a growth agent. And sometimes it's hard. It's hard. Every time in my life that I have grown, it's because I went through something hard. It's because I was willing to fail. But I didn't allow failure to be the marker of my life and to say, well, that's it. He's done. He's finished. Put him out to pasture. He's got no more left. No, I look at failure as an opportunity for growth. Failure is a platform for success. Failure doesn't define me and keep me down and say, well, he's no good. He's washed up. He's given all that he's got. No, community's hard. It was never meant to be easy. If it was easy, everyone would be running to it. But what we do in culture is we run to what is easy. <clears throat> Because it takes less, less energy, it takes less effort, it takes less time. Because we just want it here and we want it now. Growth can be hard. But in the end, we always benefit it. We always benefit from it. Being inconvenienced for the purpose of showing hospitality to others, it's always going to be hard. And it will even be harder for those who are outside of your circle. It's easy to do life with those that we're comfortable with, those that we're closest to. But those outside of the circle, it's always going to be harder. I think it's always easy, again, to show hospitality to those who are close and harder to those who are not. In inconvenient hospitality means that you and I begin to orient our lives around the grassroots needs of the local church, the local community. And opening our lives and our emotions to others. So where does that leave us? Where does that leave you and where does that leave me? Because I believe there's a couple of things that we can do as next steps. The first one is this. Volunteer to serve. Are you serving? 
What are you doing to help someone else? What are you doing to help somebody else grow in their faith in Jesus? And I know all the excuses because I've used them. I'm not qualified. I don't have time. I've only been doing this Jesus thing for a little while. Really, when's the last time you volunteered to make a difference? Oh, but Corey, I'm busy. My schedule, it's full. But is it full of stuff that is meaningful? I mean, really, when's the last time that you volunteered and helped somebody else? Maybe that's your next step today. That you want to volunteer. You want to find out, well, where can I begin to use my gifts, my, my talents, to begin to pour into other people, to help them know and follow Jesus? Where, where can I do that? Maybe for you, your next step is this. Next Sunday on October the 2nd, we're going to be doing something just a little bit different within our services. They're going to be a little bit shorter, and we're going to give time and create space to have community with other people. Maybe there's people that you've been sitting around week after week after week, and you don't even know their name. We're going to provide an opportunity where you can get around a table and sit down and just begin to talk to people and get to know people, begin to open your life. And I know what we'll normally do will normally gravitate to the people that we're already comfortable with, our circle. My challenge to you is reach out to somebody that you don't know. Even if you don't know your name, their name, that's okay. Just walk up to them. Hi, my name's, what's your name? And just start a conversation and get to know people. Because here's what I do know. There's the potential that someone is sitting in this room that somebody is watching online that nobody here is ever connected with. And they're just waiting for you and I to reach across and say, hi, my name is. So maybe your next step is to volunteer. Maybe your next step is to say, you know what? I'm gonna join next weekend. If I'm online, I'm gonna make sure that I'm in person next weekend and be a part of what's happening here. If you're in person, you're here and you come and you're part of what we're going to do to begin to have community with others. What you may discover, if you're here and you're not in a community group, you may come across somebody that is and you can go and be a part of their group and begin to do life with other people that are just like you. Will you pray with me?